Oh, hello. Welcome to the 2013 Hundy Challenge. Today we're going to be discussing Passing Through Indiana by Foster's Australian for Beer. Well, this is the last E.M. Forster book on the Modern Library Top 100 list. Um, I didn't really expect to blow through his work so fast. Um, I kind of enjoyed him. I thought he's a pretty good, pretty good author. However, that being said, uh, this book didn't remind me very much of his other work. Um, the ones that I read, anyway. Uh, this was written later uh, and with a very different uh, background. Um, this reminded me most out of the 39 odd other books that I've read uh, this year of uh, Kim. Okay. Uh, no surprise there, um, just in terms of they're both taking place in India, both coming from the perspective of the colonialist rather than the natives. Um, I thought this book was easier to read and easier to track than Kim. Kim was very much like throw you in the deep end. Um, it would have been nigh unreadable, I think, without the footnotes. That was one case where the footnotes didn't bother me because really every page on Kim, there was like 10, 15 uh, references to something in Indian culture, various religions, various areas, ranging from the very obscure to the very obvious. Um, I am kind of glad I read that one first because some of the stuff that comes up again in Passage to India, I was already prepped for. It was just a lot more, um, I don't know if subtle is the right word, but uh, Forster didn't throw quite as much spaghetti against the wall with this one as Kipling did with Kim. Um, I feel like Kipling almost kind of wanted to get the entirety of the Indian experience in between, you know, 400 pages or whatever. Uh, whereas Forster was very much, um, had a narrower focus uh, with just one Indian character, uh, viewpoint character. I mean, there were a couple of Indian characters and just like one or two colonial characters. And it was a very different feel to the book. It was kind of, kind of a love story. Um, a little bit of a peculiar one at that. Um, Aziz, who is an, an Indian Muslim in Chandrapur, if I'm recalling this all correctly, um, he kind of fell in love in a not, not in a romantic way with a, an elderly or older uh, English woman called Mrs. Moore, who comes to India, and she she kind of says, what, what did she say? She said, I want to see the real India. But she never said she wanted to see real Indians, and there was kind of a lot of hay made of that in the book. Um, but uh, Aziz kind of uh, idolizes her, puts her on a pedestal, and considers her the greatest of all you know, women, let alone English women. And it actually, as the book progresses, um, a sort of a cult develops around her that the Indians, um, they come to think of her. Well, I think a lot of them didn't know who she was at all. They, they called her S, S Miss S Moore instead of Mrs. Moore. Um, and they kind of developed a little cargo cult um, around this woman because Aziz believed – anyway, Aziz gets in trouble. He's kind of accused falsely of a crime, um, and he claims that Mrs. Moore would straighten it all out. Oh, if we could just get Mrs. Moore here, she would fix everything, and there's no reason to believe that. Mrs. Moore liked him, but I think several characters pointed out, well, that doesn't mean she would have testified for you. That doesn't mean her testimony would have gotten you off. Um, you know, and, and all these other things, but, uh, it was interesting that he put her up on a pedestal 
as something to worship, um, which I guess was kind of part of Forster's... Um, this was a very anti-colonial book, but it also, you know, criticized some of the behavior of the Indians. And I think what he was saying was, with that portion of it anyway, the way that Aziz worshipped, so to speak, the, um, the English woman was similar to the way that many of the natives came to worship and put on a pedestal the sahibs, the, the whites, the English. Um, but, uh, you know, aside from that part of the satire, a big part of the satire was um, the way that the English all insisted that the only way that India could be taken care of was in a very paternalistic way. Um, that, that they needed the British. the British. The British had to be there to administer everything. But the British couldn't um, consort with the natives. And this was... This was if, there, if I was going to say there was an underlying theme to the book, it was this. It was like the, the colonialists and the natives cannot consort or bad things will happen. And repeatedly over and over in the book, any time that someone challenges this... Um, they're kind of put in their place. And, uh, of course, the British believe that's because the Indians can't be trusted, and the Indians believe that's because the British can't be trusted. And finally, the tagline of the book is when Aziz and um, Mrs. Moore's... Was it Mrs. Moore's son? No, it was Fielding, another character. Um, kind of the only, the only British guy that actually supported him during the trial... Um, as opposed to Mrs. Moore, who wasn't even in the country at the time. Uh, they're talking, and Aziz says, you know, uh, I wish that we could be friends, but that's... And I, he's like, I desperately wish that we could be friends, but that will never happen while the British in, are in India. And he said, I hope that we have a revolution, you know, it doesn't matter if it's 5, 10, 15, 50, or 500 years from now, I hope we have a revolution so that you and I can be friends, because I want to relate to you on a human level. And so it was kind of a lot of it was about the dehumanization that comes with colonialism, um, and it's kind of a condemnation of that. Um, it was an interesting book. Um, like I said, this was a much, I guess you would say, less ambitious, or it had a lot less um, moving pieces than Kim. So, like I said, I'm kind of glad I read Kim first to get the baseline knowledge of kind of the colonial system and and what was going on in India at that time. I'm not obviously not very well versed on Indian culture or anything. Um, so in a way, I'm kind of glad I read Kim first to get that baseline knowledge, and then the passage to India seems much easier. But I almost feel like maybe if I was doing this again, or if any of you are thinking about doing this, read a passage to India first, kind of ease your toe into the you know baby pool and then when you're ready to dive in dive in with kim thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next time